Uh, since the, the very beginning of, of creation, uh, the Almighty God has chosen to work his plan and purpose through, through families. Much of scripture is devoted to the, to the story of families, isn't it? If we go back right to the beginning, to Genesis, back to Adam and Eve, that was the start of, of their uh, family. And it, it ends with, with one family as well, doesn't it? That the purpose of God ends with God being all and in all. And, and the Lord Jesus married to his bride, the, the true ecclesia at, at the, in the kingdom and at the end of the, of the thousand years. And the stories that we have in scripture about families are very varied. Um, some are good, some are faithful, uh, some are bad, and we've, we've got the two uh, given for us. Now, what I plan is to do today is to look at three particular families. We're going to look at the, the Kenites in our first session, uh, Rechabites in our second session, and then, God willing, this afternoon we're going to consider uh, the family uh, of Asaph. And all of those families, are, we've, we've chosen those because they're excellent examples of, of longevity. Okay? And what we plan to do is trace them through the scriptures and see how their families remain faithful for very long periods of, of time. I thought we'd start with a bit of a test this morning and to check that you're, you're all awake because it, it made me start thinking about sort of how long our families have, have been faithful, as it were, sort of in, uh, in the truth. So a little bit of a test. Uh, if you're baptised, could you, could you raise your hand, please? If you're, if you're in the truth at the moment, raise your hand. Keep your hand up if your parents, if they're alive or fallen asleep, if they were in the truth. Keep your hand up. So most people, second generation. Keep your hand up again if your grandparents were in the truth. So a few hands going down. Great grandparents. Still one or two. Great great grandparents. Oh, I think we're down to two. Great great great. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I think that's five. Is it five generations? Okay, it's five generations. I think you might come across the odd Christadelphian that perhaps is six. Uh, generations uh, in the truth. That community we've been going 150, 160 years uh, approximately and, and that passing down from generation to generation is a challenge to us isn't it? That the, the influence of the world is creeping in on our, on our families and so that challenge to remain faithful over time is something that we all need to face. Now of course we expect the Lord Jesus to return very soon, but we hope to get words of exhortation, words of encouragement, and practical points uh, to take with us in our families and how we can uh, continue that longevity of faith from the examples that we have uh, from Scripture. Okay, so the first one we're going to consider is this uh, the family of the, uh, of the Kenites. Okay, uh, so where, where do we start with the Kenites? Well, I'd like us to go to the book of Judges. We're going to uh, do a bit of background. Uh, first of all, I'd like us to go to Judges chapter 1 uh, to start off with, please. And we are going to have to do quite a bit of Bible uh, turning uh, in our sessions because we're trying to piece together something um, that, uh, that occurs in just a few verses around the, the scriptures. Um, Judges chapter 1 and uh, verse 16, we're told, And the children of the Kenites... Moses' father-in-law went up out of the city of palm trees and the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah, which lieth in the south of Arad, and they went and dwelt among the people. Okay, so we're told there that Moses' father-in-law, that he was a Kenite. Okay, so that's where we're starting um, this morning. And uh, Moses' father-in-law, uh, he's called by a number of names in scripture. He's referred to as, as Jethro, as you'll, as you'll know. Uh, he's also referred to, to as uh, Rule or Raguel. So there's three uh, specific names that are referred to of Moses' uh, father-in-law. Now, we'll be coming to this verse in, the, in a few moments. So we won't turn to it because of time. But we're told in Numbers chapter 10 and verse 29 that, that this, this family uh, that starts with Moses' father-in-law, this tribe of the Kenites, that they're also known as Midianites. And what we find is that the Kenites were a, a sub-tribe, as it were, of uh, Midian. So turn with me, please, to First uh, Chronicles chapter 1 and verse 32. And let's have a look at the, the tribe of Midian and where they came from. So it's, I think it's important to set the foundation uh, of, this, of this family. So first to Chronicles chapter 1, and we'll be going to Chronicles quite a bit uh, this morning. First to Chronicles chapter 1, and uh, we're going to have a look at verse 
32, where we're told, Now the sons of Keturah, Abraham's concubine, she bears Zimran and Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shuar and the sons of Jokshan, Sheba and Dedan and the sons of Midian, Ephra and Ephra and Henoch and Abiah and Aldei. All these are the sons of Keturah. Okay, so um, Keturah then is uh, referred to in Chronicles as, as Abraham's uh, concubine. In the Genesis record, she's referred to as his wife. And if anybody could explain to me why we've got the two uh, afterwards, I'd be very much appreciated. Um, but Abraham uh, took Keturah. We think it was later on in, in Abraham's uh, life. And then uh, Keturah uh, had these sons, of which one was uh, Midian. And then Midian had, had various uh, sons as well. And the point of introducing uh, that, uh, brethren and sisters, is that the, the tribe of Midian, of which the, the Kenites uh, come from, is that they were descendants of Abraham, but they were not descendants of promise. So like Ishmael, uh, they, they did not inherit the promises that were given to Isaac and Jacob and, uh, and so on. So they were outside of, of, that, of that line, although having that, that heritage of, of Abraham uh, still there. So the Kenites then, they, they were like us in many ways, brethren and sisters. They were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, from, without, from the covenants of promise, having no hope and, and without God in uh, the world. So that's our starting point with the, with the Kenites. Their, their name's interesting. Their name means, the Kenites' name means uh, smiths, so suggested that they were possibly uh, blacksmiths. And, and as we said before, that the founder of the, of the Kenites, or the first one that we, we come across, is this man called uh, Jethro. So let's go to Exodus chapter 2 then, and let's, uh, let's pick up the story with uh, Moses' father-in-law, with, with Jethro. Because that story, of course, starts with um, Moses. In Exodus chapter 2, you'll, you'll know what happens in Exodus chapter 2 well, um, that we've got the, uh, the birth of, of Moses and how he was brought up in, in Pharaoh's court by the, the daughter of Pharaoh. And then he becomes uh, involved in a, in a fight um, and he has to flee away. And in Exodus chapter 2 and verse 15 we're told, And now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Okay, so in terms of our time scale, we're, we're talking about BC 1480 approximately, and you'll see that relevant as we go through. Uh, and he has to flee, Moses has to flee from uh, Egypt, and he goes down into Midian. So this is the area where uh, the Kenites uh, were, were living, um, and the, the, the Midianites uh, were living uh, down here uh, in this area. Uh, and when Moses uh, goes to this area, what does he find? Well, verse um, 16, now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. Okay, so he comes across these seven uh, women, uh, these daughters of Jethro, and, and seven, of course, is the, the number of, of the covenant. And, and Moses, finding these, these women here by this uh, well, and he helps them um, defend the well with, with these shepherds. Um, and there's perhaps echoes here of Jesus' meeting with the woman of Samaria in the, in the New Testament, or perhaps the meeting of Jacob and Rachel by the well. We've got a similar pattern uh, that we have here. And these um, seven uh, sisters take him to their father. Verse 18, and when they came to rule their father, he said, how is it that you are come so soon today? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, and where is he? Why is it that ye have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Okay, so... Um, the first thing we note of, of Jethro, who here is called Ruel, is that he is very hospitable. He, he almost chides his, his daughters for not bringing the man in and not showing him uh, hospitality. Um, 
Rule's name means the friend of God. And this characteristic of hospitality is something that all of us should exhibit in, in our lives. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8 says, Above all, keep love one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. So we should be hospitable. And that's what this man here was. He was very hospitable. And Moses is welcomed in. And then in verse 21, and Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses, Zipporah, his daughter. Let's just stop and, and think about this for a moment. It says that Moses was content to dwell with this man. And Moses, we know, was a great man of, of faith. So if Moses was content to dwell with this man, that demonstrates to me that Jethro, that rule, must have been God-fearing. We don't know the extent of his knowledge, um, but we do get characters of, of faith that occur in, in scripture that perhaps have some, some, in, some knowledge and then some of them, their, their faith doesn't grow. Others, their faith does grow. So an example would be Laban. He had a, a form of respect, didn't he, at, at times for the, for the God of Israel. But his faith was, um, was, was certainly weak and he, he lacked it at, at the end. Uh, others that appear on the scene that we don't know their backgrounds with great faith, men like Melchizedek, um, for Example, And this man here, Jethro, he perhaps follows a similar pattern. Perhaps his knowledge was incomplete. Maybe Moses assists him with that. And he marries uh, Zipporah and they have a child. Verse 22, she bare him a son and he called his name Gershom. For, I have, I, for he said, I've been a stranger in a strange land. And, and we always relate the, the meaning of the name Gershom to, to Moses. And Moses was a stranger in a, in a strange land. Land, um, but also there's an element here that applies to, the, to that family that they were outside of the covenant of Israel. That, as we said earlier, they didn't have the promises that went through the line of um, Isaac. We're going to have a look at a little bit of an aside now. Can you come back with me to First of Chronicles and this time chapter four? Because there's a, a fascinating little reference here in First of Chronicles four, which I think is relevant um, to this. Uh, to this family. Uh, we don't have the detail in, um, in Exodus. First Chronicles chapter 4 is um, a very fascinating list of genealogies that we have here. And we're told that these are very ancient things. So in verse 22 of First Chronicles 4, it says, And Joachim and the men of Kaziba, Joash and Seraph, who had the dominion in Moab, and Jeshu be Lehem, and these are ancient things, or as the revised version says, the records are ancient. So the records here in First Chronicles 4 are very, very old. Now, it's quite hard to pin down exactly which uh, time periods these records relate to. But we're going to have a look at verse 17, because verse 17 says, And the sons of Ezra were Jetha and Mered and Ephah and Jalon, and she bare Miriam, and Shemaiah and Ishbar, the father of Eshtimoa. Now it's suggested that um, this uh, Jetha that we have here, um, who's the son of Ezra, that Jetha is Jethro. That's Moses' father-in-law. The reason why we say that is that these are genealogies that are associated with Judah, and the Kenites become associated with Judah, a few verses earlier, we've got the Kenizzites that we're not looking at this morning. The Kenizzites are very closely related to the, to the Kenites. Okay? So if Jetha uh, is uh, Jethro, we've got something very interesting happening with Jethro's brother. Uh, just come down a few verses to uh, verse, well, verse 18, only one verse. And his father, Jehudijah, bare Jered, the father of Geda, and Heber, the father of Soku, and Jechthiel, the father of Zanoa. And these are the sons of Bithia, the daughter of Pharaoh, which Mered took. And if we follow that through, we find that Mered, that he marries uh, Bithia, Pharaoh's daughter, and then the two of them have these uh, children. Uh, and that opens up quite a fascinating insight, doesn't it, brethren and sisters? Because if that's right, it would seem to me that when Moses fled into, into Midian, Pharaoh's daughter 
possibly, that had raised uh, Moses, follows Moses uh, to uh, Midian to find him. Um, she, she's there with them. She's introduced to Jethro's brother Mered. They get married and their daughter they call Miriam, uh, which is also significant, uh, isn't it? So just as a little aside, um, a, 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 another aspect of this, uh, of this family... <coughs> And we know Moses was here with this family for a long time, wasn't he? He was there for for 40 years and then he went back to to Egypt and he freed God's people from the hand of Pharaoh. And the the children of Israel begin their wilderness uh, wanderings. But that's not the the first, the only time that that Moses and and Jethro uh, come in contact with each other. Let's go to our reading. Let's go to Exodus chapter 18. So we've seen that Jethro... Um, was uh, God-fearing in in Exodus 2, uh, that he was also given to hospitality. And then in Exodus chapter 18, the reading that we had read, um, he meets uh, Moses again as the children of Israel are on their wanderings. Verse 1 of Exodus chapter 18, When Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt... Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, and her two sons, of which the name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I've been an alien in a strange land. So he goes out to meet uh, Moses. Verse 7, And Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, and did obeisance, and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare, and they came into the tent. So we get a sense of the, the great reverence that this man of faith, Moses, has for his father-in-law for Jethro. He does does obeisance to him and uh, kisses him. And then verse 8, And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the travail that had come upon them by the way and how the Lord delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who hath delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and hath delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, for in the thing wherein thou doubt proudly, he was above them. And and we get a sense of how Jethro's faith has developed here because he now recognises the greatness of God and he rejoices in God's goodness and he recognises that that God is far higher than, than anything else. And then in verse 12, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came and all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. So here he's acting as a, as a priest. We're told that he was the priest of, of Midian earlier. But now that, that priesthood is being associated with Israel. And we don't know whether it was actually Aaron that did the actual offering. Uh, but Jethro certainly organises this. He took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. So he acts in a priestly capacity and then he shows his hospitality again. He eats bread um, with, with Moses and the other uh, elders of, of Israel and, and that points us forward to the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't it? And the, the, the eating of bread and, and wine as we are commanded uh, to do. And then later on in this chapter, we don't have time to look at the details, but Jethro gives very uh, wise words of of encouragement to to Moses and instruction as to how he should do in terms of the organisation of the camp and how he was taking too much upon him and how he needed to spread the burden of that uh, organising. So the founder of the Kenites then, the starters we've got, this man Jethro, a man given to hospitality, a God-fearing man and a man who acts in this, in this priest-like uh, capacity, having accepted uh, the God of uh, Israel. Now, that's not the last time we come across the, uh, the Kenites in the wilderness wanderings. Let's go on a few chapters, uh, to this time to Numbers and chapter 10. Okay, so um, the children of Israel continue on. And then in Numbers chapter 10... And uh, verse uh, 29, we come across them again. Uh, And Moses said unto Hobab, the son of Raguel, the Midianite, and that's Jethro, okay, so that's the other other name, uh, Moses' father-in-law. We are journeying to the place of which the Lord said, I will give it 
Come thou with us and we will do thee good. For the Lord has spoken good uh, concerning Israel. And, and we saw how Jethro rejoiced in the, in the goodness of uh, God. But what was the reaction of uh, Hobab, who would have been the brother-in-law to <coughs> Moses? Well, verse 30, and he said unto him, I will not go, but I will depart to mine own land and to my kindred. And he said, Leave us not, I pray thee, for as much as thou knowest how we are to encamp in the wilderness, that thou mayest be to us instead of eyes. And it shall be, if thou wilt go with us, yea, it shall be that what goodness the Lord shall do unto us, the same will we do unto thee. So Moses was concerned about how he would navigate this great company through the, the wilderness. And the terrain of the, of the wilderness was indeed extremely challenging and Moses felt that even though he had the pillar of cloud and the pillar of uh, the cloud and the pillar of fire by night to guide them that he still needed additional uh, wilderness expertise as it were and, and he calls on this family to help him he calls on this family that thou mayest be in, to us instead of eyes so the Kenites then were asked to be the eyes of the children of Israel in um, the wilderness and that's very interesting, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Because spiritually, the wilderness wanderings were to bring them to the promised land. So in many ways, Israel then here, are, we could say, were spiritually blind. But the Kenites are, are enlightening their eyes to provide that way to the kingdom, to provide that way to the promised land. Land. And if they did that, Moses said that the Lord uh, would, would show goodness, or that, and that they would show goodness um, to uh, the Kenites. And as far as I'm aware, from the Numbers records and Exodus, we, we don't know whether the, the Kenites actually did that or not. Um, but we do know much later on in their history. Let's go to 1 Samuel and chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And um, we're in the time of Saul here, so we're going on a, a long time in their, in their history. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, uh, verse 6, And Saul said to the Kenites, Go depart you, uh, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. Isn't that wonderful? All those years on, brethren and sisters, so that kindness is now shown to the Kenites, because presumably they were the eyes of the children of Israel in uh, the wilderness. So what do we know of the Kenites so far? Well, they were nomadic tent dwellers. That's why Moses wanted them um, in, the, uh, in the wilderness wanderings. They were given to hospitality, that comes out very strongly. They were God-fearing, and they were the eyes of the nation in guiding them uh, to the promised land. So that's the foundations of, of this family. <coughs> we're going to move on now. We're going to move on uh, some hundred years, about 150 years from the time of Moses. And we're going to go to the time of the Judges. And let's go to Judges and chapter 4. So you remember in chapter 1 in Judges, that verse that we went to right at the start, it said that the Kenites were aligned to Judah. Okay, So there was there was an affinity between the tribe of Judah and this nomadic tribe of the, of the Kenites. And then in Judges chapter 4, um, the Kenites appear again. Um, and Judges chapter 4 is all about uh, Deborah and uh, Barak. And it's the oppression of, of Jabin and Sisera and his uh, army of iron chariots that afflicted um, the Israelites very greatly and the character that we just need to consider is in verse 11 where we're told now Heber the Kenite which was of the children of Hobab the father-in-law of Moses has severed himself unto the Kenites and pitched his tent unto the plain of the name which is by uh, Kadesh so um, we're about BC 11 uh, 50. And we've got this man Heber who's described as a Kenite and we know that Heber's wife was Jael so she would have been a Kenite as well or certainly married into uh, that uh, family. Uh, and Heber I would suggest is the only bad Kenite that we have recorded for us 
in uh, the, the scriptures. See, Heber had aligned himself with Sisera. He'd moved his tents. He'd severed himself from the main tribe of the Kenites. And he had aligned himself uh, with Sisera. And he, he tells uh, Sisera what, what Israel's plan was to go up uh, to Mount Tabor and, uh, and so forth. But we know the story, don't we? We know how the iron chariots of Sisera went up to, up to the north, up to Mount Tabor. That the Lord discomforted them, that uh, great rain came, the chariots got stuck in the mud. Um, there was a great rout of the army and, and Sisera had to flee. And where does he flee? Well, verse 17, Howbeit Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber, uh, the, the Kenites. So we find here that uh, these Kenites, they're still tent uh, dwellers. Um, and Sisera naturally goes to jail. Why? Because he knew that the Kenites, that Jael and Heber, would show him hospitality because that's what they do. That's one of their characteristic traits. And Jael shows uh, Sisera great hospitality. Verse 18. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not. And when he had turned in unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. And he said unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. She opened the bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. That characteristic of, of hospitality comes very strongly there. That's what this family did. But Jael was a woman of faith. She knew that these people were oppressing Israel. And she asked to do something about it, wasn't she? Verse 20, again he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent, it shall come, that when any man doth come and inquire of thee, and say, Is there any man there, that thou shalt say, No. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent, and an hammer in her hand, and went softly unto him, and smote the nail into his temples, and fastened it into the ground, he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. And it must have taken great faith and great courage for uh, Jael uh, to do this, in, in smiting that tent peg through the head of uh, Sisera. In type, it's smiting the serpent through the forehead, isn't it? The destruction of sin, the removal of apostasy out of the land of Israel. And Jael is greatly commended for this great act. If you come over to chapter 5 and verse uh, 24, we're told, Blessed above women shall Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. What an accolade. Blessed above all women of the tent. That's how great uh, this woman, this, this Kenite woman's faith uh, was. It's a remarkable victory um, that uh, occurs here. This victory, brothers and sisters, of um, the Sisera Jabin armies, the, the characteristic of this, of this victory is, is a lot to do with the chariots, isn't it? Because it was the chariots of iron uh, that was there and doing. And there's a little link here, I think. So if we come down to verse uh, 28, we're told that uh, the mother of Sisera looked out of the window and cried through the lattice, why is his chariot so long coming? Why tarry the wheels of his uh, chariots? Now you're thinking, well, what, what's the link here? Well, we need to just think about the, the meanings of the names chariots in the scripture, because uh, in scripture there's two uh, Hebrew words for uh, chariots. They're both occurring here in verse 28. The last one why tarry the wheels of his chariots? That's the, the first one that we've got on the slide here. It's the Hebrew word makaba, and it means to saddle. Okay? The other Hebrew word for chariots is the word rechab, which is the first word here that we've got. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Chariots rechab, which means uh, to ride. Now, why is that significant with our story? Well, come with me, please, to First of Chronicles and chapter 2. Because this line of Kenites only goes uh, so far in the scriptures and, and, and very soon we lose the thread um, of them. But what we find is that this family continues. First of Chronicles and uh, chapter 2 and uh, verse 
verse 55. And, and this is really our key verse, if you like, for this morning. First Chronicles 2, verse 55. And we're told, the family of the scribes which dwelt at Jabez, the Tyriathites, the Shimeathites, the Succothites, these are the Kenites that came of Hemath, the father of the house of Rechab. So what we find then, brothers and sisters, is that uh, these Kenites, the, uh, these, this family, lays the foundation for the house of Rechab, for the Rechabites, which we're going to consider in our second uh, session and the Kenites, they're smiths, that's what their name means, they're blacksmiths. But Rechab um, means to ride, it's normally translated as chariot uh, in, the, in, in the scriptures. And, and we'll, we'll be thinking about why that change took place um, in, our, in our second uh, session. But I'd like us to, um, to conclude this, this, this morning by thinking about one other man in scripture who I think is a Kenite, um, and we've got him in First Chronicles and chapter 4. So just uh, turn over a page in, in First Chronicles and chapter uh, 4. And it's a man by the name of uh, Jabez. And, and Jabez is recorded for us here in First Chronicles 4 and, and verse 9. And we're told, And Jabez was more honourable than his brethren, And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bear him with sorrow. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldst bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldst keep me from the evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. I'm going to propose to you that that Jabez was a Kenite. Why do I say that? Well, he's associated with some of the genealogy that we saw earlier, Uh, of Jethro in in verse 17, which seems to be Kenite's uh, genealogy. But also, you'll have noticed from our verse in chapter 2 and verse 55 that the families of the scribes which dwelt at Jabez, they were the ones that were the uh, Kenites, that that, um, were the foundations of the the Rechabites. And here we have a man named by the same name, this man uh, Jabez. And he's, he's closely... Uh, associated with, with Judah, and, and we get that here. Jabez uh, was a little town outside of, of Bethlehem in uh, Judah uh, country. So what do we know about uh, Jabez? Well, we're told that he was born in sorrow. His mother called him Jabez, saying, because I bear him with sorrow. And that's what Jabez's name means. It means sorrow. And we think about the, the Kenites, that's a very apt name for them because they were outside of the covenant of promise. They were strangers and without hope in this world by natural descent. And so um, he was born in uh, sorrow. He's also described as being more honourable uh, than his brethren. And, and some of the characteristics of faith and hospitality that we've seen of the Kenites would suggest that they're more honourable in many ways than natural Israel. So he stood out as, a, as, a, as an example. He then goes on to say that Jabez prays to God in verse 10, and the prayer of Jabez is that, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed and enlarge my coast, and that thou my hand might be upon me, and thou wouldest keep me from the evil. Now, there was an evangelical uh, writer um, that made millions from a book that he wrote about this man Jabez, because based on these verses, this evangelical writer said it's very legitimate to go to God in prayer and ask for the extension of material wealth, to ask for your borders to be increased. And that's what he thought Jabez here was asking for, and the Americans lapped it up and bought many, many copies of this book. But is this what Jabez is asking for? Is he asking for an extension of material wealth? Well, I don't think he is. Bless me and enlarge my border. Isn't he asking to be part of the promises to Abraham? Isn't he asking to be incorporated into the blessing of the land which uh, Abraham was promised in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 18? And to thy seed have I given This land, isn't that the extension of the border that Jabez is wanting? And also, Jabez prays to be kept from the evil, that it may not grieve me. 
Keep a marker in uh, 1 Chronicles 4, and let's go back to Genesis chapter 48, because this echoes from the patriarchs, it echoes from uh, Jacob. So Jacob is asked to be kept from the evil, Genesis 48, verse 16, when Jacob's looking back on his life, and we could follow this through in a bit more detail and go to uh, Bethel as well, but we, we won't do that because of time. But Genesis 49, verse 16, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let th- my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So I think Jabez here, he's echoing what was given to uh, the patriarchs. And isn't it wonderful, brothers and sisters, when we go back in First Chronicles 4, end of verse 10, and God granted him that which he requested. So Jabez was given um, that uh, request. So let's summarise uh, what we've looked at so far, uh, our time. Has, has gone. So what, what have we found out about the Kenites? Well, they were given to hospitality. They were the eyes of the nation in guiding them to the promised land. They showed courage under jail in removing apostasy from uh, the land. And I think we've seen through Jabez that they very much wanted to be part of the promises uh, to Abraham. And uh, God willing, in our next session, we'll see how that family develops uh, through to the Rechabites.